Wonderful. I'm so happy. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces here, which is lovely. And I'm really happy to see new faces as well. So the topic for today, I know that it's a very hot topic. And a couple of things before jumping into the presentation and the slides that I'd like to clarify. So I've been working with this framework that I'm going to share with you for a couple of years now is not a new framework, but the application in leadership is. So it's been on since a lot of years, but in the latest five years has um, left academia, where it was a really normal topic and was inserted into the practicalities of daily life. So not just for leadership, but in general. So you'll see that it is a very interesting framework that you could apply with any coachee, any mentee, any person on, with, on yourself as well. Um, this is one of the things. And the second thing that I'd like to mention before beginning is that I'd love to create a space where we all share and we all learn. I'm not an expert, I'm a learner, and I'm uh, here just sharing something that is extremely useful for me in my, in my work. And hopefully we are all going to experience one of the things that uh, we will talk related to how create vertical leadership development. It's called the HEAT and it's called colliding perspectives. And I will try to create that during the session so we can experience a little bit of that. So this is the title of our meeting today, Coaching for Vertical Development, Helping Leaders, Helping People Should Be Better to Transform and Grow. And I like to begin with this quote, which is extremely connected with the soul of vertical leadership development. The only true voyage of discovery the only fountain of eternal use would be not to visit a strange lands, but to possess other eyes, to behold the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to behold the hundred universes that each of them beholds, that each of them is. This is taken from um, A La Recherche de, uh, de Temps Perdu, de Marcel Proust. And it is exactly the representation of what we are going to experience later today. So before jumping into this, I'm going to ask Nicola, could you please um, share with everybody the first poll? Because before jumping into the whole thing, I'd like to know from you, and if you want to share from which part of the world you are connecting also, it would be awesome. Mm hmm okay, 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 I see a lot of threes, UK, London, Finland, Ireland, Switzerland, Mumbai, Bolivia, Dubai, Valencia, okay. A lot of threes. Canada, Prague, beautiful Prague, Alcorcón, Germany, Luxembourg. Oh my God, extraordinary, amazing. So, what I can see from the poll, and Nicola, you will correct me if I'm wrong, is that the three, three is the... Yeah, I think our, our yeah. highly scientific eye casting reveals three, then followed by two, and then just a couple of ones. Okay, okay. So this confirms something that I thought before jumping into and creating these slides and, and, and thinking about what to share with you. And it is two things. The first one, I will try to be very simple and talk just about the basics for then open spaces for all of us to work together and to think together and to create together. 
This is on one side. And on the other side, I think that to tackle into practicalities is going to be extremely important because if you want, I can share a lot of resources with you. I can share a lot of papers from academia. I can share videos, um, books, uh, websites, a lot of information. So a lot of the things that you can learn can be learned later on. And we can concentrate a little bit more on the basis and the practicalities, how we can use that with, uh, with our coaches, okay? So the first thing to understand is the name, vertical versus horizontal. And what does it mean in this particular um, framework? So when we talk about horizontal development, we think like a cup, you can see there it is a, a cup or a glass. So try to imagine a glass, a glass of water and pouring water inside. So you add something to the, to the continent. So you put things, skills, knowledges, concepts. So it's what you think. And this is a very important dimension, dimension, and we are not going to exclude it. And this is another interesting point in vertical development. This dimensions, the horizontal and the vertical work together, and we want it so, because the real transformation arrives when they are the two connected. The difference with the verticality, that is not so vertical, and we are going to, to, to see that later, is that we talk about capacity. So it is the same glass with all the water that you poured into expanding. So this is why you can see all the arrows here going outside, because it is a different way of thinking. It is a different way of looking at the world. It's like using a different pair of glasses. You are transformed, therefore everything is transformed as well. So it's growing abilities to think differently, different perspectives. It's a different way of responding and acting in front of a more complex environment as the one that we face every day. So it's increased capacity. So we are not talking about skills, but we are going to be talking about capacity all the time. Very quickly, everything that I'm going to say today is based on a lot of research in academia, but mainly these three names that are um, columns to me. So Suzanne cook Reuter, of course, because her extensive, extensive work, years and years of work producing a fantastic framework, was the original framework. Uh, Jan Rybeck, of course, which I consider my, my teacher, and Nick Petrie. And as I said, I'm going to share a lot of information, videos with them, uh, a lot of things, if you are interested in knowing more about this topic. Yeah. But one disclaimer is that you might encounter the same basics of what we're going to discuss together under different names. So any adult development theory like the ego construct development, leadership maturity framework, stage development, leadership agility, agility, I don't know how to pronounce that, yeah. then each one of them is more or less the same. So it's based in the same uh, basement. And that basement is that we evolve in stages and we move in between the stages, depending on a lot of circumstances. So it's not just related with our age or our nationality or our maturity. It's also related with the present moment and the environment our stakeholders, the place we live in, the situations we have to cope with in the present moment. So keep this in mind because we are going now to see what all the different frameworks have in common. And all these things that I'm going to read to you and share a little bit with you, all these have been measured. So we have a lot of research on that. We have a lot of data about that. 
So for all the frameworks, what we have discovered is that as human beings, we are not static. We are in permanent evolution, even as adults. And you might be very well aware that our neurons are all the time connecting with new neurons until we die. So there is the neurogenesis. Well, I, I'm not going to talk into that, I promise. But it's a very interesting concept to think that we are in permanent evolution. Give us hope. All human beings actively make sense of experiences. We are not passive um, humans. We are transforming each sensation, each thought, each emotion immediately. We are making sense of each experience we have. Adults evolve in predictable ways that we call stages of maturity. Those stages can be measured. So we have data about that. And you can find different names for the same stage, but they are the same. Each stage involves more complexity. It's a different perspective and a different mindset. Stages follow a logical sequence, creating a hierarchy of stages over a lifetime. These worldviews are stable but temporary. This is crucial. So whenever you are in a stage or moving in between stages, we are going to see that in five minutes or going from one to another, depending on the situation. This is all always temporary, is momentarily, because it's connected with what is happening in the present moment. It's based in life conditions, internal resources, and external support. Not everyone grows through the entire trajectory of development. This is another thing. Each individual is unique and we need to respect this uniqueness. People tend to settle into the most suitable stage that can become their permanent station in life. When I say permanent, I'm not saying that they are stuck there, because as we saw before, they are going to be moving from one to another, depending on the situation. But People, we all tend to go back to our comfort zone. So when we find ourselves really comfortable in a certain state, the, ten the tendency is going back to that state over and over. The stage sequence is invariant and no one can skip a stage of development. This is key. It's something that I need to go through to really evolve. Early stages share a narrow, simple, concrete, static, and protective stance. We will talk more in the uh, next slide about this. On the opposite side, a broader, more complex, abstract, dynamic, context-driven, and truly exploratory stance is the characteristic that you can find in the later stages. And one uh, thing that I'd like to clarify as of now, we talk about early stages and lower stages. So even if we talk about verticality, it's not a hierarchy here. It's no low, up. It's not about that. So it's early in time and later in time. This is also crucial. Those at early stages, cannot understand later stages. Those at later stages understand, and pretty well, early stages, but they sometimes don't want to. They might not be willing to go back there. It almost always takes several years to move from one stage into the next. And this is extremely important. So. In the research that we have, what we know is that usually it's something in between three to five years from one stage to another. But that, once again, depends on the person and their context. So it can vary. 
person. So these are the names that I personally use. But as I said before, you're going to find a lot of different names that refer to the same stage. So we use the metaphor of the trunk of a tree. You're going to see this in all the literature around development, adult stages. And you go from the center and you go around the center because the idea is that the second stage involves the previous one and the third stage involves the second and the first and so on and so, so far and so forth. So the name of the stages that I use are opportunist, diplomat, expert, achiever, redefiner, transformer, and alchemist. The first three, and let's say that the achiever is in between, are called conventional stages because they share certain features. All the people in those stages tend to feel experiences first as solid. It is what it is. It is what I say. This is the truth. And also, each thing is separated from the other. So they struggle in getting the big picture, in understanding the, in connecting the dots, understanding different layers. They are concerned about excellence and about perfectionism. And of course, about others, what others think about them. And usually we find a lot of need of control in those early stages. If we take again a shiver, as I said, because it belongs to the two groups, a shiver, redefiner, transformer, and alchemist, they are different and they are called post-conventional stages. They all feel and sense, and I'm talking about feeling because they can incorporate the sphere of the emotions, it's not just thoughts, it's emotions, sensations, and actions. And they know and they experience that everything is interconnected. They're, they make less distinction between themselves, others, and the environment. Fluidity is the main trait for these um, stages. All right, so let's be practical a little bit. So let's say that that is the theory and let's say that we accept it. Let's say that we like it. Okay, very nice. I can use different tools. There are a lot of tools that I will share with you that you can utilize with your clients to measure the different stages. A couple of things about the tools. They're fantastic tools. The VLM is fantastic. Uh, um, I have another one that is wonderful, the, the map, that was the first one, yeah. and the Global Leadership Profile. There are a lot of different tools. They are different in the way that they measure, but results are consistent and are all good. But be careful if you jump into using those tools, because people tend to really understanding which stage they are, if it is a fixed thing. And as we saw at the beginning, the most important thing is to understand the movement, what we call the range. The range is the ah, lampiezza. So they can move from one place to another. The more the range, the more the evolving, the more latter the stage. So be careful if you eventually get to use one of those tools. So going into practicalities again, and we need the three together to create change. So if you have one, but you don't have another, you are not going to get results. Keep this in mind. So let's talk about the first one, the heat experiences. The heat experiences are very interesting. And it implies to get outside of your comfort zone voluntarily. So you know that it's going to be a stretch and you know that you're going to grow. And you say, yes, 
I want to try this thing that is entirely different. I want to fit, to be transferred from, I don't know, the Madrid base to Singapore. I want to do something that I've never done with this new team member that I have. I want to experience things. Usually, these are first-time experiences, totally outside of the comfort zone. So you need to feel a certain level of discomfort. If that discomfort is not present, the heat experience is not going to happen. And it's very connected with results. So in this phase, results matter. Now, let's talk a little bit about colliding perspectives. This is fantastic because this involves connecting with others. And it's basically networking. So it's sharing your experiences with others, practicing active listening and getting others' experiences. It's connecting, trying to understand points in common, trying to understand differences. It's to broaden the perspective, is to listen to others and trying to figure out how they look at the world with their own pair of glasses. Ideally, this phase leads to clashing ideas. So why do you think that way? Explain me more. Give me, give me the reason why. Have you tried out? Not. Let's explore this together. So the clashing is important because if you are in a room and everybody says, yeah, yeah, this is perfect, fantastic, wonderful. Let's jump in. How much grow you can get out of that? Different networks. This is also extremely important. So think about how you can expand your own network. So it's colleagues, it's peers, it's a club that you belong to, it's a certain reunion that you attend monthly or yearly. How much do you get from those experiences? How much do you share in those experiences? Different perspectives are key. And now, elevated sense-making. For EMCC people, it's very simple. It's the reflective practice. It's the time that we have to stop everything and reflect. Reflecting in the moment, in the moment that the things are happening, or creating the space and the room to try to understand, collect all the information that we have, try to understand exactly what happened and make sense of that. So it is, of course, a learning experience and it involves reconfiguration. So it's not just learning, it's, okay, what I'm going to do about it now? So it's the pure transformation. And this is why each one of these three conditions for growth to happen are related to the what, the who, and the how. And remember, because we are going to practice on this, let's take the Ashiva, because it's important, because it's in the middle of the two main groups, and the Transformer. Okay? So this is just an idea of how to work with the different stages. And you're going to see on the left certain characteristics, certain features. So, for example, the Ashiva, the Ashiva want to accomplish things. They want to things to get the things better and better and better. And the feeling of accomplishment is really important. We are talking about people that are very busy and the feeling of responsibility is really high in the scale. Their focus is on setting goals and achieving those goals, both. Extremely important. So they are doers. They have a, an enormous difficulty in saying no. They value getting others on board. So come and see. Let's make this together. They are team people. Their identity is based on setting and achieving goals. There are not many differences in between their identity and the achievement of their goals. They, they gain the sense of confidence in the outcome. Outcome 
is important because it creates the feeling of safety. Okay. And there is a high risk on, of burnout, really high risk. So we can't remember exactly, but I think that it's 83 or 84, can't remember exactly. Percent of burnout, the corporate world, comes from the Ashiva stage. So what can we do? Two things that are going to be wonderful to work with any stage, any. The first one is to acknowledge exactly where they are. So you need to acknowledge their features. So it's not our work. So this is how I live it. It's not my work as a coach to push them to create that fluidity, to push them towards growing. My work as a coach, as we all know, is first to be there, to listen, to vibrate with whatever it is in front of me and to honor that. This is the first thing. And all the growth can come afterwards. In different ways, we can ask interesting questions regarding achievement, the meaning of achievement. Is there any difference between achievement and fulfillment? How? Do you feel it? In which part of the body do you feel it? When do you feel it? Do you remember the last experience? So all the sort of questions that we, we love to ask. Experiences in doing versus being. These people are doers. So what does it mean to be, to vibrate with what it is without jumping into action? What about the strategy? Because execution is well, very well known. What about the strategy? So we mentioned that these people usually are team people. They value highly the opinion of others. So why not to work with the 360? They are really open to feedback, incredibly open to feedback, and also ready to fit forward because they are doers. They love to learn from failure because they know that they can set the scenario for the next goal. Yeah. And something that I found personally extremely valuable is exploring the meaning of the word responsibility and guilt. So what I was thinking is that taking this into consideration, I could jump into the last um, slide with a question for all of us to work together and then go into the breakout rooms, okay? So these are the questions that I have for all of us. So based on how to work with the different stages, and provided that we know nothing about the stages. Let's take the Ashiver, that is the only one that we know a little bit more about it. So, what are the cues that suggest a mindset? So, as coaches, without working with the tools that I mentioned, so the GLP, the map, so without working with the tools, with the assessments, in our dialogues, in our work with our coaches, how can we understand the stages of our coaches? How can we create something together with the coaches to explore this? How do I notice this stage? When do I notice that I am in that particular stage? How frequently? What do I find most challenging about interacting with this particular client? that is in this particular stage, what do I find most appealing? And this is key because the stage of the client is going to resonate in the stage that we are. And the stage of the client is going to be connected or not connected with the stage of the company because everything is interconnected. And something that is very interesting to see is when how when there is a really big gap in between let's say the stage of the company and the stage of the client how to bridge that gap and what would a successful interaction look like and other questions and come on let's create something together let's let's feel the heat let's try to get out of our comfort zone 
and let's try to create something all together. I'm really curious about what you discovered in, in this brief 10 minutes. So I'm going to hand it over to you, to anybody that wants to share something, experiences, questions, whatever. I'm going to put myself on mute for a moment and looking forward to hearing from you now. This is really insightful. So thanks so much for the input so far. And what what's sticking with me is um the recognition that you can slip between the levels very easily so the context is really important i've got a question martin which is what um to what extent do people need to be conscious about the levels in order to develop their awareness of which level they're in in order to facilitate their evolution through them um and to what extent could that be done through other means Thank you so much for that question. It's fantastic, so insightful. And yes, uh, is how do you say in English? It's a do double-edged sword. Is that the expression? It is exactly that. So you need to be very careful. And again, the most important thing is to connect with your client, to resonate with the needs of your client. So you are going to know if you know your client well, hopefully, you are going to understand, first, what is the need of that person? Second, you can open a space to talk about it and ask questions to see to which extent that person really needs to know, is ready to know, is open to explore, and you can create a dialogue based on that. And then both of you, coach and coachee, create the rest of the path. Does that make sense? It does, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, I, I do work with groups, so it's it might not be as easy to develop that individual, um, yeah, you know, discernment really or understanding of what each mm. person needs. Mm. But this is very interesting. It is another layer because working with groups also involves working with a company. So there are a lot of different elements there mm. that we might talk about in, in future discussions, but yeah. that needs to be considered because, as you said, context is important. I always say that context is king because yeah. it really is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Maite, I really loved your question before we went into breakout room. Um, how do we coach a client where there's a gap between the stage the person is at and the stage that the company culture is at, where the, the person is more evolved. And I'm thinking of, of somebody I've met who's stepping into leadership, and she is more evolved than the culture. And it's hitting her just as she's stepping into it. And I'm wondering, would your answer to my question be the same as your last answer to resonate with her needs and open that space would it be a similar approach thank you thank you caroline very interesting and yes it would be a similar approach of course because it's in, in, in fact it's at the heart of any approach but i would consider another thing very important another element which is the risk a person that has a later stage compared to the company, is at risk. And burnout is just one to mention. So it is extremely important to check all the time system of values, levels of stress. Um, I would add purpose and mission. And exploring that, you as a coach will be able to feel to which extent this person can move thanks to the flow to earlier stages in order to accommodate themselves to the company if this is what the coachee wants to do what do you think about this yeah i i think it's really about her having her toolkit to to manage and ground and center herself and i'm also thinking 
she may need some allies. So some like-minded people, peers as hmm. well. Hmm. Remember that part that we talked about colliding perspectives? Mm -hmm. So peers who support this person, but also peers who can add a different element mm -hmm. to introduce something different and allow this person to keep on evolving and growing despite of the circumstances. Nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Andrea, Andrea. So I, I was also wondering. You you mentioned as a coach, you wouldn't impose growth. Yeah, you said you would detect what stage level they are in, but you wouldn't necessarily push them. Um, so my question is basically, how does that concept fit in with um, contracting? Maybe the coach. Coaching doesn't want to grow <laughs> or doesn't want to transform. Um, and the other question I would have is talking about a gap. Can a coach who is at, a low, at, at an earlier stage of development, can he coach someone who is an, at an, a later stage of development? How, how is that match working? Amazing questions. Thank you so much, Andrea. So on the first one. Well, respect is above all. And the fluidity, well understood, of the contract needs to be there all the time. So you can establish a certain contract. And at a certain moment in your work with the client, different elements arise. Then is the real perfect time to stop, analyze, and create a new contract. If the coach thinks that the coachee is ready to explore new things and to grow, but the coachee doesn't go to go there. Why on earth are you going as a coachee impose your uh, beliefs or thoughts on the coachee? It's not your place. It's not, it's not your work. Our work is a different work. We walk with the client all the time and we need to be very careful because the temptation is there the temptation oh this person could be fantastic to work on this and this and that and using this tool and this because and we might unconsciously begin to push and the person is not ready so extremely we need to be extremely careful about that and the second question was about the gap oh if the coach is in a in a let's say at the early stage and the coachee well that creates a problem in many ways not just in the connection but so also in the communication usually what happens is that the coachee is going to share situations and the coach will need to ask a lot of questions to really grasp the meaning, but not just to help the coachee to make sense or to understand or to ignite an aha moment or no. It's because the coach is going to find out that they are not understanding. They are not understanding what is happening because there is a gap in the full grasping of the situation. Let's remember that these are these circles in the trunk of the tree are related to maturity stages. So, excellent question. Thank you. I see a point in the chat um, from Claudine. And Claudine, I don't know if you want to come off mute, whether, whether you are. I can't see you on the screen, but, but you say that you find clients come to coaching, especially when they're moving or in transition between stages and experience some confusion. And um, I think, look, see if you're here. So, uh, well, I'll repeat it for the sake of, um, in case others haven't seen it. So I find that clients will often come to coaching when they're in that that stage of transition, even unknowing between stages. 
and that that can be a quite a painful time and that may be one of the reasons why they've sought out coaching because they have this sense of of sort of tearing or sort of seasickness about it's almost like a baby when a baby suddenly realizes that if you you're leaving the room and they do or don't know or they start to realize that you still exist when you're outside of their line of sight you know it's that sort of and and so I'm wondering just really practically I understand all the pieces about you go with where people are and you're not pushing them to develop through the stages because it's not a hierarchy but at that moment it often feels that that sort of sense of being lost this framework I find can be really helpful for helping people understand that they are in some kind of transition and so I do feel like I want to at least ask questions that help them make sense of how to navigate that transition and I just wondered what what kinds of questions you ask at that point because they don't there's not necessarily a knowing of you know I want to go here or I don't want to go there but if they want to do the if they do want to develop then what what kind of questions do you ask for helping the transition awesome question Claudine but really difficult to answer because it depends on the coachee it depends on the context it depends on the part of the transformation so which stages are this particular coachee moving from but one thing that I could say is the following is trying to help what we do with all our coaches, try to help them to first understand that what they are undergoing is absolutely normal. That can be painful, so you can resonate with that pain, but through questions, you can try to help them to get some clarity and to find their own answers. And this kind of confidence infused that even though they are in the middle of the fog, they are going to find a way out. Does it help a little bit? I know that is not too much. It does, thank you. So for me, it goes back to Sean's question and the conversation you had with him about, you know, when does it help and deciding when it helps to name it and to use whether it's these categories or any of the other categorizations that you say that there's different language and different models. But I, I find with the right client, it, it, it does help to name it because it, it sort of normalizes it and says this is perfectly natural and it's actually quite exciting. And this, when the client really wants to know, helps them enormously precisely to that, to normalize. So, thank you. Thanks everybody. And do you know what, we we are at time, but we could continue this conversation, I think for the next couple of three hours easily, because there's just so much, so much richness. And, so, and and I think every every answer then sparks more thinking in other different directions about where we can take this and what we can do with it. But I mean, my, my 10, um, just, just one last question for me, if that's okay, which is, um, I mean, you, you started off saying that you don't have all the answers for this, but you're, you're fascinated by the questions. And I was wondering what, what, kind of, what kind of impact has the conversation here had on you? And where do you yourself go next? And have you taken anything yourself from this, which has made your um, neurons spark in different directions? Weird. Well, uh, one thing that happened that I thought that would happen, so I was really anticipating that in my head as sort of an expectation, is that. So it's a tiny thing it's like a seed that can ignite more questions finding more possible answers that ignite more questions but something that we can create collectively to me the colliding perspectives in the in the three parts that the three need to make transformation happen colliding perspective is key so to be able to hear to others to learn from others to reflect after about that but it's a collective work to me it's fundamental so I feel that and I well I have myself a lot of questions because you guys ask excellent questions so I will have to meditate myself on those as well Nathan, thank you very, very much on behalf of the NCC Global for leading this conversation here today. It's just been it's just been fascinating. 